Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today I want to talk to you about a puzzle game called Lights Out that, well, it's not so popular anymore, but it made a big splash back in the 90s. Put all the lights out. Lights out! It looks so easy. It's not that easy. With thousands of different puzzles, it threatens to put the entire nation on the blink. It's Lights Out for America. Lights Out and New Deluxe Lights Out. Okay, even if that commercial doesn't ring any bells, there's a very good chance you played this puzzle at some point in your life because it's quite possibly the most overused puzzle in video games ever. It's used in Mario RPG, in Diablo 4, and Diablo Immortal. It's used in Path of Exile, Watch Dogs 2, World of Warcraft, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, a game called Trover Saves the Universe, and frankly, way too many video games to list off. Here, there's probably over a hundred big name video games that it appears as a puzzle in at some point in time. I really like this puzzle because it has some really interesting mathematics behind it. And in particular, you can solve it via some linear algebra. So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to talk about how to solve this puzzle via linear algebra. We're going to talk about how things change depending on the size and shape of the grid. And we'll talk about what linear algebra can actually tell us about this puzzle. Is it always solvable? If not, when is it not solvable? How many solutions does it have? And so on. All of these problems we can answer once we understand the connection with linear algebra. So let's get into it. So let's start by talking about what Lights Out is. And it's a puzzle game that's typically played on a square grid like this one right here. It's made up of buttons or lights. And when you click on one, it's gonna to toggle not only that button that you clicked on, but also all of the buttons that are directly adjacent to it. For example, if I press on this top left button, it's gonna to toggle the button that's directly to the right of it and the button that's directly below it, okay? It doesn't affect diagonally adjacent buttons, just left, right, up, and down. Okay, similarly, if I press on the button that's on the left center, then it's going to toggle that button, but also the buttons that are above and below it in the corners, and the button to the right of it in the center. And the goal of the game is to turn all of the lights out, okay? They started all on in this configuration here. I want to turn every single one of them off. And the tricky thing is that when you start clicking on buttons or lights here, they start they interact with each other because they affect the adjacent buttons as well, right? So it's not as simple as just, you know, press every single button, it turns them all off. Okay, these interactions, these overlaps make it tricky. And, you know, there's not sort of an obvious intuitive way to find a configuration of button presses that does the job. It turns out for this three by three grid, you can press buttons in an X shape. You press the four corners and then the center button, and that'll do the job. That'll turn all of the buttons off or all of the lights off. Okay, but how is that found? And what if we change things a little bit? What if instead of playing this game on a 3x3 three three grid, what if we play it on a 5x5 five five grid? How does this change? Is there still a solution? And if there is a solution, how do we find it? Okay, it turns out there is a solution. Here it is, but this configuration of button presses that does the job, it's much more complicated and sort of less intuitive. Okay, so how is this found? How can we find this configuration of button presses? And how can we generalize this to find a configuration of button presses that works no matter what the size of the grid is? How can we find a configuration that works for four by four, for six by six, for maybe a weirder shape of grid? Like maybe if we have a triangular grid, is that still solvable? And if so, how do we find a solution? Okay, like you can fumble around randomly pressing for a little while, but Let's try to find something more systematic, something that always works. And I mean, you don't have to play this game starting from the all on configuration either, okay? Oftentimes this game is played starting say from a five by five grid where some of the lights start on and some of them start off, okay? And it's just a random configuration that ha doesn't have any clear pattern to it. How can you find a way of turning all the lights off? And even more so than that, like how can you find whether there is a solution in the first place? And that's what we're going to solve in this video, okay? We're going to show that you can turn this problem into a system of linear equations, and then you just do things that you learned in a linear algebra class. You apply Gaussian elimination to solve that linear system. To solve the lights out game, what we're going to do is we're going to represent the lights out grid via a vector. And each entry in the vector is going to tell us about one of the lights in the grid. It's going to tell us whether it's on or off. So first, to start off, we have to agree on some ordering of the lights in this grid. We're going to call the top left corner that light. That's light number one. And the one directly to its right, that's light number two. The one to its right is light number three. And then light number four is you go down to the left of the second row. 
and then light number five, and then light number six, and so on, just in standard reading order, left to right, then top to bottom. That's how we're ordering the nine lights in this grid. And so the nine entries in the vector represent those nine lights in that order. In this particular grid, lights one, two, and three are on, so we're going to put ones in entries one, two, and three of our vector. Lights four, five, and six are off, so zeros in entries four, five, and six of our vector. Lights seven and eight are on, nine is off, so ones in entries seven and eight, a zero in entry nine of our vector. And that vector there represents this grid. Now, when I press on a button or light on this grid, it's going to toggle a bunch of lights on the grid. So it turns on to off and off to on. And this is the exact same as saying in the vector representation, it turns some ones to zeros and zeros to ones. Now, we can represent this mathematically via what's called mod to addition. Okay, so for example, if I press on the top left corner of the grid, that's going to toggle lights one, two, and four. So what I can do mathematically to implement this is I add the vector that has a one in the first, second, and fourth entries and zeros everywhere else, but I don't add in the normal way where one plus one is two. I add in a way where I only keep track of the parity of the sum. In other words, if I get one plus one is two, I say, ah, well, two is even, that's the same as zero, okay? So I kind of add, except I wrap around so that two is the same as zero, and three is the same as one, and then four is the same as zero, and five is the same as one, and so on, okay? You wrap around and you only ever use the numbers 0 and 1, similar to how on this grid here, there's only two states. There's off and on. And if I do this, you'll notice when I add these two vectors, I get the exact same thing as if I press on this top left button. And this works no matter which button you press on. Pressing on a particular button of the grid just corresponds to adding a particular vector to our current vector that describes the state of the board, okay? As long as you do that addition mod 2, okay? Every button has its own vector, though, okay? So in this particular case, where we've got a 3x3 three three grid and 9 buttons, there are 9 different vectors that we might add. For example, pressing on the top center button corresponds to adding the vector that has a 1 in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 5th entries because the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 5th buttons are the ones that are toggled when you press that top center button. Now our target here is the all zero vector. That's what we want to get to because remember our goal is to turn all of the lights off. So we want to turn every entry in this vector into a zero by adding some combination of these nine particular vectors that correspond to the nine buttons that we can press. But how do we figure out which combination of buttons to press? Well, at this point, we're going to introduce some variables. Let's say that we want to press the first button x1 times, the second button x2 times, and so on, down to the last button, the ninth button, x9 times. Then what we want to solve is this equation right here. We want to solve, well, whatever our current starting vector is, plus x1 times the vector corresponding to that first button, plus x2 times the vector corresponding to the second button, and so on, all the way up to x9 times the ninth button's vector equals the all zeros vector, right? And in particular, we want to find an assignment of those nine variables, x1 up to x9, each of them having value 1 or 0, indicating that we press that button or we don't, for which this equation here is true. For this particular configuration, it's not too hard to check that if you set x1, x2, x3, x4, x7, x8, and x9 all equal to 1 and the rest of the variables equal to 0, then you get a solution of this equation. In other words, to solve this lights out puzzle right here, we should press on buttons 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, and 9. Okay, but how do you actually find that? And, well, you find it by realizing that this is just a linear system of equations, so all of our techniques from linear algebra work, okay? We can just throw this into a matrix, do our row operations, right? Apply Gaussian elimination, and we'll get our solution that way. The only thing that you have to be a little bit careful of is that when you do this, you don't introduce any numbers other than 0 or 1. In other words, you continue to work mod 2, just like we did a second ago. But other than that, everything works the exact same way that you're used to it working when you do Gaussian elimination involving real numbers. Let's go through the details of solving this linear system just once to make sure that we understand all of the technicalities. 
Okay, so when we throw this into a matrix, what happens is every one of the columns, those correspond to the nine vectors that we saw earlier. In other words, for example, this first column here, it has a one in the first, second, and fourth entries. That's because when you press the first button on the grid, it toggles the first, second, and fourth lights. Similarly, the second column has ones in the first, second, third, and fifth entries, because those are the lights that are toggled by the second button on the grid, and so on for all nine columns. This augmented right-hand side here, what this is, is this is your start vector. This is the vector that describes the starting configuration of your board. For us, the starting configuration has lights 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8 on, so those entries in the augmented right-hand side have 1s, the rest of them are zeros. Okay, to solve this linear system, what we do is we just do standard elementary row operations. And remember, there are three of them. The first one is where you swap two rows. We're allowed to do that. Nothing changes in mod 2, so that's still going to be a thing. The next row operation that you're probably familiar with is what's called the addition row operation, where you take one particular row and you add a scalar multiple of some other row to it. And that row operation, it's still fine. There's one slight wrinkle here because we're working mod two, and that is, well, these values of C, the scalar multiples, those can only be zeros and ones because as far as this problem is concerned, zeros and ones are the only numbers that exist. And if I were to do row i plus zero times row j, that would be a really silly thing to do because that just means, well, replace row i by row i. There's never a reason to do that. Okay, so the only addition row operation out there that's ever worth doing is just row i plus row j, right? The, the addition row operation that you get when you choose c equals one. Okay, so we're going to be doing that row operation a whole heck of a lot, actually. That's going to be the main bread and butter in solving this linear system. Okay, and then the third type of row operation is the multiplication row operation, the scaling row operation, where you take a particular row and you just multiply it by a scalar C. And when we're working mod 2, there's literally never a reason to do this row operation because, again, the only scalars are 0 and 1. You can't choose the scalar 0 in this row operation, even if you're working over the real numbers. You're not allowed to multiply a row by 0. You are allowed to multiply by one, but why on earth would you? Again, that just means replace row i by row i. There's no reason to do this. It doesn't do anything. Okay, so we actually never do this scaling row operation because we're working mod two, and we're only left with the two row operations above. Those are still fair game, and they're all we're ever going to need to solve this linear system. Okay, so let's use these row operations to solve this linear system. Let's bring this matrix here down to reduced row echelon form. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that, hey, there's a leading entry in the top left corner. I like that. I don't like the fact that there are leading entries below it in rows two and four. So I'm going to add row one to row two to clear out that one in the left-hand side of row two. And I'm also going to add it to row four to clear out that one that was in the leftmost column of row four. And now that entire first column, I'm happy with it, right? It's got a one at the top, and that's got no other non-zero entries anywhere in that column. So now I basically forget about the first column for the rest of what I'm doing. I say, okay, let's go over to the second column. I want to sort of patch up that second column to make me happy with it. And while I would like there to be a leading entry in the 2-2 two -two entry, there's not right now, so I'm just going to swap rows 2 and 3, and then I'm going to have a leading entry in the 2-2 two, two entry, and now I can just sort of repeat this game all the way down the diagonal, okay? I like that leading entry in the 2-2 two, two entry. I don't like the corresponding non-zero entries in rows 1, 4, and 5, also in the second column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add row 2 to rows 1, 4, and 5 to clear out those other ones that are in that second column. Okay, and then I just continue in this way, applying Gauss-Jordan elimination to bring this matrix down to reduce rush long form. It could be lights out for America. A total distraction that could lead to total destruction. A contagious new puzzle that's becoming an obsession. Honey, it's time to put the lights out. All you have to do is put all the lights out. Put all the lights out. Lights out! It looks so easy. It's not that easy. With thousands of different puzzles, it threatens to put the entire nation on the blink. It's Lights Out for America. Ah, okay, now we're finally in reduced row echelon form. And the way to interpret this reduced row echelon form is that, well, okay, the left-hand side 9 by 9 block... That's the identity matrix, right? So that tells us a few things. First off, it tells us that there's a unique solution 
to this linear system. In other words, there is a unique combination of button presses that does the job to solve this lights out game, okay? And what it is is, well, it's just that right-hand side vector, okay? On the right-hand side, we see that there's a one in the first, second, third, fourth, seventh, eighth, and ninth entries. That means those are the buttons I should press. I should press buttons one, two, three, four, seven, eight, and nine. And that's exactly what we saw, you know, about two minutes ago or so, okay? Another thing that this reduced row echelon form tells me is that, well, because that left-hand side is the identity, not only is this particular configuration of lights on the 3x3 grid solvable, in fact, every single configuration of lights on the 3x3 grid is solvable. No matter which configuration of lights are on or off, there is always a unique combination of button presses that you can do to turn all of the lights off. Hopefully at this point we understand how the lights out game works on 3x3 grids. Okay, so let's ramp up a little bit. Let's ask how it works on larger boards or boards of different shapes. And to give a bit of a flavor for how things can change when you work on different boards, let's look at the 5x5 lights out game. Okay, on the 5x5 grid, well this time there are 25 buttons, so we're going to work with a 25x25 25 25 matrix. The way that we're going to construct it is the same way that we constructed it for the 3x3 grid. Okay, each column of this matrix just describes which buttons or lights are toggled when we press on that button. So for example, for this 25 by 25 matrix, the first column, it's going to have a one in the first, second, and sixth entries, because when I press on button number one on the 5 by 5 light toe grid, it toggles buttons one, two, and six, okay? Because six this time is the button in the leftmost column of the second row of that 5 by 5 grid. Okay, and then similarly for all the other columns of this matrix, the, the second column just tells me which buttons are toggled when I press on the second button of the light to grid and so on. All right, so that gives me the left 25 by 25 chunk. We're going to augment it on the right again with, well, ones in whichever entries correspond to buttons that are on in my starting configuration. Okay, so for now, let's just pretend that we start with the all on starting configuration. So I'm going to put all ones on the right hand side there. Okay, and now what we're going to do is the same thing that we did before. Just row reduce, bring this down to reduce row echelon form, and hopefully we'll have a solution sitting, waiting for us in the right-hand side. So let's do that. Boom. Reduce row echelon form. And this time, the reduce row echelon form is quite a bit different than it was for the 3 by 3 lights out game. In particular, that left 25 by 25 chunk, it's not the identity matrix, which tells us a few things. For one thing, it tells us if there's a solution... It's not unique, okay? And this time there is a solution because if you look at those zero rows on the bottom, remember the only way that you get no solution for a linear system is if you have zero row on the left-hand side and a non-zero thing on the right-hand side. And fortunately, that doesn't happen here. In this reduced row echelon form, whenever we've got all zeros on the left, we also have zero on the right, okay? So that tells us that the five by five all on grid is solvable, okay? And actually we saw that earlier, right? We saw a particular configuration of button presses that does it. And well, actually more than that, there's not just one one configuration of button presses that does it. There's four different configurations of button presses that do it, because in this linear system, what we can see from the fact that there's no leading entry in columns 24 or 25, well, the variables x24 and x25, those are free. So I can set them to be whatever I want. I could set x24 and x25 to both be 0, or 0 and 1, or 1 and 0, or 1 and 1, okay? And then figure out what all of the other variables are from that. In other words, there are four solutions, and the way you can construct them is press the 24th and 25th buttons however many times you like. You could press them zero or one times each. And then there is a button press solution for the other 23 buttons that then solves the game, okay, that turns all of the lights off from there. Another thing that this tells us is that on the 5x5 five five game grid, the lights out game is not always solvable. It depends on what your starting configuration of lights is. Okay, exactly one quarter of starting configurations are actually solvable, and every time they are solvable, there's four different solutions that do the job. Another way of thinking about this is on the 5x5 five five lights out grid, buttons 24 and 25 are 100% completely useless, okay? If I press on button 24, then, okay, that toggles four lights, right? It toggles the, the 24th button, but also three other buttons, but I could have toggled that exact same configuration of lights by just pressing, you know, other buttons on the board instead. I could have done that using only the first 23 buttons. And similarly, with the 25th button, okay, that toggles three of the buttons or lights. 
But, you know, to toggle that exact same configuration of three buttons, I could have just pressed some combination of the first 23. So the 24th and 25th, they're completely redundant. And that's basically what linear dependence and linear algebra is, right? Like, in a sense, the 24th and 25th buttons, they're linear combinations of the first 23 buttons, right? They don't get you anything new in the range of this matrix. In other words, they don't get you any new configurations of the lights out board that can be reached. All right, so let's go back to thinking about boards of other sizes and shapes. If I just have any board whatsoever, is it always solvable? Well, no, we just saw some examples where even on a five by five board, it depends on the configuration of starting lights, whether or not it's solvable. Okay, but what if I simplify a little bit and I just say, okay, I've got some weird board, but all the lights start on. Is it possible to turn them all off? And it turns out the answer is yes, no matter how big your board is, and furthermore, no matter how ugly it is, it doesn't have to be a square or rectangular board, it could be triangular or weirdly U-shaped or whatever, like it literally does not matter what it looks like. It turns out, yes, there's always a configuration of button presses that does it. And where that comes from is, well, a whole bunch of linear algebra, okay? What you can do is you can show that, well, okay, you throw this into a matrix in the way that we've just talked about, and then you row reduce it, you bring it down to reduce row echelon form. When you do that, it turns out your reduced row echelon form, always, 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 it's going to have an odd number of ones in every single column in the main part to the left of the augmentation bar. Okay, the reduced row echelon form, it's always going to have an odd number of ones in each column. And in particular, what you can argue from here is that the all ones vector is in the range of that matrix. Okay, and if the all ones vector is in the range of that matrix, that means if I augment on the right hand side with the all ones vector, yeah, there's a there's a way to solve that linear system. There's a solution to that linear system. In other words, there's a configuration of ones and zeros in a vector x such that a times x equals the all ones vector. Or phrased more naturally, there's a configuration of button presses such that when I press those particular buttons, yeah, it turns every single light from on to off. It toggles every single button. I think I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to say bye, everyone. Thanks for watching. I put a bunch of links down in the description. Okay, I talk about this Lights Out game a fair bit in my Linear Algebra textbook, so I've pointed you to where you can find that in the textbook. I've also put a bunch of links to where you can play this game online and where you can find more information about it if you're interested. Thanks for watching, everyone.